And good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure to be here on a Thursday night with you. Thursday night is my absolute night of the week because I'm anticipating the weekend, but it's not quite here yet, and usually Thursday night television is pretty good. So this will be a, a nice prelude for those of you on the East Coast to um, check in, and I think somebody told me American Idol's on tonight. And speaking of all things American, um, social media, although it's international and not just American, certainly the United States has embraced social media in a big way. And healthcare is starting to embrace social media in a big way. And we're going to talk about that tonight, what it is, why I call social media the conversation, what my election of the big three, um, in my mind for healthcare, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube are the big three, how you can integrate them with your website, and um, what some other social media tools are, how social media impacts HIPAA, and then we'll take your questions about um, what you're dealing with or um, how you would like to get started with social media in your healthcare entity. The definition of social media that I love comes from Brian Solis. His uh, website is www.briansolis.com. He is a very interesting blogger in the social media space, and I recommend uh, that you take a peek at some of his writing. Um, he's not specific to healthcare, but I think he's got great information about social media. And I'm just going to talk about the short version of social media because I think it is so perfect. Any tool or service that uses the internet to facilitate conversations. And I think that word conversations is what it's all about. Uh, we want to hold conversations with our patients. And why do we want to hold conversations with our patients other than the ways that we hold them now, which are primarily face-to-face -face and on the telephone? Well, because things are changing in the healthcare space. And any tool or service that uses the Internet to facilitate conversations, as social media does, gives us the opportunity to interact with patients in a non-traditional way. Everybody knows that we're getting reimbursed less and less. Uh, physicians and other health care providers, our reimbursement continues to go down, and expenses continue to go up. How do we make those two things meet in the middle? My opinion is technology. Um, and I'm not a um, all technology for all situations person, but I do think technology is one big answer for healthcare. We know that in 2014, um, if everything continues um, the way it has with the um, uh, Patient Affordable Care Act, that we are going to have um, many new patients who are insured and who will be seeking care in practices, people who have not been seeking care in practices before, who have been seeking care in the emergency room or sometimes in, in urgent care facilities, will now be seeking care, especially preventive care, since that is covered under the new plan. We know that there is more emphasis on education and wellness. So we know the conversation is going to be go beyond just the what brings you in today, I'm sick, I have the flu, and try to take those conversations to what are you doing to um, keep yourself healthy, how are you eating to try to manage your disease state. We know that reimbursement is also going to be based on outcomes. And if we're talking about very limited interaction with our patients, then we may have trouble trying to control those outcomes. So the more conversation, oops, did I just flip us there? The more conversation that we have, um, the more potential that we have to control patient outcomes. I think participatory, participatory care is huge. 
patients taking a very active role in their own care. And if that's going to happen, again, we need to have more conversations in between the face-to-face -face visits. And competition. If you are competing with another practice or another healthcare entity in your town or in the next town, and you use social media to have more conversations about more topics with your patients, I would be willing to bet that you are going to be very competitive in the marketplace. So let's talk a little bit about Facebook. Facebook is definitely my number one recommendation. Um, unbelievably, it was just founded in 2004, which just seems like moments ago to me. It is a free site, and users update each other and more recently promote their businesses. It started out, as you know, as just a college campus kind of activity, and um, it has burgeoned to become the way that many businesses are promoting their products, specifically by demographic targeting. Um, this is something that's fairly new in terms of how much information um, Facebook users have allowed to be available to businesses. Um, there are more than 600 million active users as of last month, January 2011. It is not difficult to start a Facebook account. As I said, it's free. You want to take a little time to think about it and think about what your approach might be and why you want to use Facebook. For any social media, the most important thing is, number one, determine your objective. What do you want to, what problem do you want to solve? What service do you want to enhance? What conversation do you want to start? The number one conversation that I think you have the ability to start or continue with Facebook is connecting with your consumers and building a community. It's a way to let patients, consumers know what's going on with your practice, with new doctors, with services, with announcements about school physicals or flu shots or meet the doctor nights or just commenting on a current event. That's a pretty big thing that Facebook um, allows you to do is to communicate, to have a conversation with your community about current events. I happen to manage a bariatric practice, and one of the big news stories that's just about ready to explode on the scene is that the FDA is going to um, lower the limit for lap bands, the BMI limit for lap bands. This is huge for my practice and for bariatric practices, and that's something that we want to be able to have a conversation with our community on. There are many, many stories every day in the news that your patients would like to know and your prospective patients would like to know what you think about, what your physicians think about. And this is a great way to send that information out. Conversation number two, disseminating information and building authority. Um, this is what I'm, I was just talking about with the news story. And building authority has to do with um, being able to show the community that you can answer questions. We're not talking about spe questions specific to one patient at a time. We're talking about answering generalized questions about the flu shot. What's the best month to get your flu shot? That's a great question that a primary care practice or an internal medicine or um, uh, other practice may get all the time and may answer on the phone all the time. Now you can put it on Facebook and not only make that information available to your community that signed up to see your posts, but also anybody else in the area who may be a patient, may not be a patient, may be a future patient. Uh, at the last seminar that we did, uh, one of the attendees said, 
if you could only use one of the big three, which would you use? Which was a great question. And this is my answer. It's Facebook. Facebook is really changing with the times. And as um, Carol mentioned, um, Bing um, is makes Facebook searchable, Bing the, the uh, search engine. And that's a really big deal as far as um, targeted marketing. Next is Twitter. A lot of people uh, don't know what to do with Twitter or what Twitter's all about, but I want to tell you how I use Twitter. Um, it, it, Twitter's even younger than Facebook, was launched in 2006. And it's called microblogging because you only have 140 characters to get your message across. I have to tell you, being on Twitter has really helped me to make my message succinct. I think it's made me a better writer because I have found how much junk I put in my messages, and so I try to write a little more cleanly. As of December 2010, um, Twitter was being used by almost 23 million people in the United States. Absolutely amazing. I use Twitter as a news service. I follow uh, people in the Twitter community, a lot of um, hospital and healthcare people, a lot of vendors, and a lot of people like Modern Healthcare, um, AMA News, um, High Tech Answers, a lot of people who are reporting on the news and making the news put a lot of links on Twitter. And that's how I use it. I use it to stay uh, up to the minute on what is happening in healthcare and in the specific things that I'm interested in social media, things changing in healthcare, Medicare, and cloud computing. You can also connect with other people in your specialty or your area of interest. Um, I don't necessarily recommend Twitter so much as a marketing tool, although it can be used as a marketing tool, but for healthcare, I see it more as a really high-level way to exchange and gain information um, that really is coming out much, much faster than in the newspaper. I mean, I haven't read a newspaper in a long time or in the news, and that's really great to get the heads up on things that are coming down the line um, and to scoop some other entities on that. You also want to monitor your brand. You also would like to search for um, things that people might be saying about your brand. Um, we see this a lot with um, banks, uh, cable TV, different vendors that uh, people – talk about them on Twitter and say, hey, I had a really bad episode here and I don't recommend this vendor, or boy, I just had a great episode with this vendor and I really recommend them. It's another way that you can keep an ear to the ground about what's happening. You know, if you're a hospital, if you're a vendor, listening to the um, the talking on Twitter, to the tweeting on Twitter could be a really, really big deal. And the third thing is YouTube. And what started out in my mind in 2005 as kind of just a sort of a fun, campy, sort of America's favorite home videos kind of thing has really turned into an amazing tool. Um, the statistics I gave you here are 35 hours of video were uploaded to YouTube every minute of the day which is just incredible, and videos are viewed 6 billion times a day and account for a total of 10% of the Internet traffic. That's incredible. That's in incredible coverage. And I think videos, I think people love videos, and I think videos are a source of information and education that has become so easy to put on your website that has become so easy to make available to your patients. Whether you want to be talking about welcome to the practice, whether you want to be talking about let me explain what a uh, gastric bypass is or what 
this procedure is, a hemorrhoidectomy or uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, you know, you can make your own videos with a flip camera, very professionally done, but not so professionally that the personality and the transparency of who the physician or the staff member is really comes through. And I think people respond to that. I think people really respond to that. Um, we are going to be making some videos in my practice um, for kind of an unusual purpose. Um, we are going to be having the um, brokers and the uh, benefits people who provide our benefits to our staff do videos for us about information about their benefits because I find that um, a lot of employees don't really um, know a lot about their benefits. They know kind of just enough to get by and don't really appreciate the value of the benefits. So I'm going to video my different benefits people talking about the health insurance, the dental insurance, what AFLAC is, what the retirement plan is all about. And so my staff can go look at those whenever they want, and when new people come in, they can look at the videos and then can also have a conversation with the broker. I think we know that a lot of times people don't absorb the information that we give them. We know that patients in the exam room have a hard time absorbing all the information that the physicians or the physician assistant or the nutritionist or psychologist, whoever is giving the information, it's very hard to absorb a lot of information. So we do give patient handouts, but patient videos, education videos that you've made are another wonderful way to connect patients to you, and patients really, really appreciate them. So the two conversations I have here are introducing your practice and your services, um, which patients just absolutely love seeing your staff or your physicians or caregivers welcoming patients and um, saying, if you have any questions, call me and, and ask for Mary Pat. Um, I think that's tremendously personal. And I love to talk to patients in my practice. Yes, I have a million other things to do, but what is more important than talking to a patient? And uh, the second conversation is the same, disseminating information and building authority. Um, very, very important. Now, putting it together with your website. Now, I talked a little bit about how this might work with your website with loading YouTube videos on your website, which um, don't let anybody tell you it's super hard because it's not. You can talk to your web person and tell them, I want to put on these videos, I want to make these flip videos and, and put them on my website, and um, believe me, it is not difficult at all. I think of your website as the electronic center of your practice and um, the different social media outlets or different types of marketing that you do, kind of like the spokes out of that electronic center, the wheel of your practice. You want to use social media to attract patients to your website, to drive patients to your website. They get a little taste of something on Facebook or maybe on YouTube they come across um, what you have um, presented. And so they want to go to your website to see what, you know, what's this practice all about or what's this uh, center all about. So you want to make sure that you have a, a very hearty website for your patients or your prospective patients to come to and see exactly what is going on. Um, you want to have everything up to date. Um, you want to have um, all the information available for patients. And you want to have as much educational, full-blown educational information on your website as you can. You know, it used to be many years ago when I was starting to do websites for practices, it used to be that you bought a service, um, you know, and you can still buy those services today or just provided links to the societies. That's not a bad thing at all, but patients more and more want to find the information on your site, just don't want to be directed to other sites. And we know the longer you can keep patients on your site, the more likely, if they're prospective patients, is that they will become patients 
or the more satisfied they will be if they're your current patients and want to stay your current patients. We know that patients learn, we all learn in many different ways, and if you can provide education in written form, in an audio or a podcast, in a YouTube video, um, or in um, a face-to-face -face seminar or meeting, you are making something av available for every different learning style. And I think that's where we're really coming. When we talk about being paid for, for outcomes, that's one of the things we really have to utilize is lots of different methods to get the message to the patient. Of course, you want to make sure your website um, and your social media message is consistent. And again, that's where you want to start with what is your objective? Um, what do you want to do? Do you want to attract patients to a new service? Do you have a new physician that's starting from the ground up? Do you have, um, is it a new merger? Do you want to make sure that your patients understand what's going on with the merger? Um, if, do you want to do a promotion? Um, Facebook is tremendous for um, doing promotions for if you have some sort of product that you sell or if you're running some sort of promotion for, you know, women having mammograms during the month of October, you know, get, you know, a gift card to a local salon or um, if you're an optical shop, just about any kind of um, healthcare entity that has specific services that they want to promote or goods that they want to promote. Doing it through Facebook is, is just a wonderful way to do it. Oh, and don't forget to listen. Um, social media is a two-way conversation. Let me make sure to underscore that. If you remember that it's a conversation, a conversation or a dialogue is not just one person going, we're fabulous, we're wonderful, come see us, come take advantage of our services. It's a listening to what patients have to say. That's one of the most valuable things you can do. That's why I love to take patient complaints in my practice because I want to hear what they're saying. I don't know what's going on in the practice from the patient's viewpoint until I listen to them. The other social media tools um, that I certainly recommend, blogging is tremendous. I have a blog, uh, Manage My Practice, and it takes a lot of time and energy for me to post an article two or sometimes three times a week. And if you're going to do blogging in your practice as a part of your website, I just highly, highly recommend it because, again, you are having a conversation, you are revealing who you are as a practice, and you're giving something to your patients or to your readers. But boy, it does take some time and some energy. So unless you have someone, hopefully you have an internal evangelist, but someone who is going to do that blogging and that's going to be part of their job, um, then it's very hard to get that um, going consistently. You can have someone outside the practice blog for you, but you have to make sure that that person um, captures the voice of the practice, speaks in the voice that you want your readers and your patients to hear. Um, texting, uh, there are a couple of different uh, major ways that texting is being used in healthcare. Um, text for baby is probably the best example where uh, the, um, the pregnant mom gets a text so often uh, that, and I'm not sure if it's more than once a week or not, that, but that um, tells the mom at the stage that she is in um, carrying the baby what's going on with the baby, how big the baby is, and, and what's developing at that time. It's a very cool program. Uh, my practice is doing a, a pretty interesting pilot with um, our bariatrics where we are um, kind of like text for baby. We are developing messages for patients 
prior to surgery and after surgery, about seven days before and seven days after, giving messages about what they should be doing or not doing at that point. And then after that, it flips over to a general kind of health and wellness sort of um, once a week message. And we feel like this, even though it's a one-way conversation, we feel like it's a way to help um, our patients continue to not only get educational information, but also feel connected to us. Um, there are virtual worlds, uh, such as Second Life. That has been used more in terms of education in uh, medical school and in teaching facilities. I have not had a lot to do with Second Life, so I cannot speak a lot about it, but it's certainly the virtual world is certainly something that I think at some point we are going to see in healthcare. Um, it will probably have some sort of revival. Not exactly sure how, but I think it's going to come. And geolocators, Foursquare is probably the best example of that. Um, and um, one of the ways that I've heard of uh, geolocator being used in healthcare was to um, let patients know where they could get uh, free flu shots. And um, it's kind of a sort of a game take on getting your flu shot. And I think games, you know, games in healthcare are going to be very big as well. So don't rule that out as silly or unprofessional because um, people do like games. This next slide is uh, kind of a list of tools and the resources that different tools take. This is um, from the um, CDC website, and it kind of shows you along the left-hand side um, uh, something that the um, spectrum of going from dissemination of information to engagement. And you see it starts with just kind of pushing information to people or to patients, and then going to videos, microblogs, podcasts, um, blogs, and then you see you're starting to get more engagement. But then you can also see the resources that it takes, the time and the staff and the cost. Um, one of the things that um, everybody wants to know is what does social media cost? And, um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, social media is free. You saw on my slides that Twitter is free and Facebook is free and YouTube, uh, except for the um, investment in the camera, is free. But, of course, the time, I can't emphasize enough that it takes a lot of time to develop these. But it takes a lot of time, hopefully, to develop any marketing campaign or anything that you're going to roll out in your practice. So I don't think it takes an excessive or an unreasonable amount of time, but you do have to consider what resources do you have inside your practice to implement some of these. I think the benefits of social media are, are, are varied and many. This list actually uh, was taken, uh, I tweaked it just a little bit from a blog called Software Insider. Um, introduce new providers and services quickly. Um, you know, we have some physicians in the world, like mine, who are surgeons that move very quickly, and sometimes I have to kind of uh, pull back on the reins. And then we have some other physicians in the space who are very slow to decide, and sometimes you feel like you have to push them. Well, for those who things are happening very quickly, social media allows you to introduce new providers and services very quickly. I think healthcare has to be nimble, and the ability to make something available to a patient population, to a community quickly, there's a tremendous value in that. It does reduce the marketing costs. There is no question, um, even taking into account the time that I just talked about, that you are going to spend less on social media marketing as opposed to traditional marketing. Social media invites customers to communicate about problems, which definitely leads to greater customer retention. Um, 
Facebook if um, you are going to be willing and you must be willing to answer questions and concerns and use Facebook as a, almost as focus groups to let patients talk about what they don't like and talk about what they like. There's no question that um, you're going to have greater market influence and brand awareness. And for some healthcare entities, oops, sorry, I bumped that. For some healthcare entities, um, they their services reach far beyond the local scope. And we know patients will drive um, to get service. So uh, don't always just be thinking about, well, in my little community, this won't work or that won't work, because sometimes you can set your sights much broader with social media. Improved collaboration across departments and improved knowledge bases, teamwork. Uh, definitely see this in my own practice with uh, the staff being involved in social media and really becoming engaged and really sharing a lot of information instead of kind of just being in their own little, okay, well, this is my job and I only need to know about my job. Definitely growth in the top line and savings in the bottom line. And as I said early on in the presentation, that's that's the only thing that every physician wants, um, savings in the bottom line and growth in the top line, and every manager as well. That's our, that's our charge. Um, a little website called insightsandingenuity.com uh, had the four C's of the 200, 2011 customer, and I just thought this was so great that um, they talked about the four C's, choice, control, closure, and continuity. And, um, you know, our customers have a choice. There used to be a time in healthcare, and I've been in healthcare for a long time, there used to be a time when patients did not have choices or their choices were very limited or they were afraid to change physicians because that was frowned on no longer. Patients will vote with their feet, no question. Do patients or customers, consumers have more control? You bet they do. Um, and I think it's great. Um, not everybody thinks it's great, but I think it's great. Um, that patients are wresting some of the control from more traditional models. Uh, patients, customers want closure. Um, they want the loop to be closed. If they have a complaint, they want it to be resolved. And continuity, our customers want to know that our message is consistent, that we are consistent, and that they can rely on us. Here's just a few little interesting facts about um, customer in 2011, and this is from the Pew Internet and American Life Project. I give you the reference for this at the end of the, the slides. Um, I follow the Pew Internet and American Life Project uh, faithfully because it talks exactly about healthcare and Internet. It's just amazing. So the first little factoid is um, the Gen X, ages 34 to 45 and older cohorts are more likely than millennials to engage in online activities. Um, I thought that was interesting. And um, key Internet uses are becoming more uniformly popular. I think it's up to 80% now that 80% um, uh, of people look for health information online. And even though the youngest generations are still more likely to use social network sites, the fastest growth has come from Internet users 74 and older. Um, they have uh, quadrupled from 4% to 16%. And, of course, as time goes on, um, we all are going to be in, in that in that bracket. And uh, look out then. Boy, I don't, I don't know what the world's going to be like then. Let's talk just a minute about HIPAA. Ed Bennett is um, a friend of mine um, who has a very interesting website. He is the um, – um, oh, now I'm going to mess up his uh, his title. He's at the University of Maryland, and let me see if I have his title on one of these. I don't think um, – he has one of these great titles like digital um, god of University of Maryland or something like that. I can't remember. But he's got a great website called Found in Cash. 
and it's Social Media Resources for Healthcare Professionals. I highly uh, recommend you take a look at um, ebennett.org because I think it's it's very, very interesting stuff. Um, and this is what he says about HIPAA. We already have guidelines. Social media is simply another form of communication. It's no different from email or talking to someone in an elevator, Bennett said. The safe advice is to assume anything you put out on a social media site has the potential to be public. And I think it is just that simple and just that complicated. Um, it's as it always has been that we are very careful to keep things confidential. They're um, just like we are careful what we put in an email. Um, you know, I always follow the rule, if you would be embarrassed to have anything you wrote in an email printed on the front of the local newspaper, then you shouldn't have put it in an email, and I do tend to agree with that. So here's some basic things that I bet you all know exactly um, how to go about this. Never post protected health information um, anywhere online, no exceptions. Um, place statements on your website and any other sites describing your social media policy. And this uh, link is, um, has got lots of different social media policies for you to choose from. So um, go there and take a look at it and, and state what your social media policy is on your website. Monitor your sites, of course. Respond to questions and concerns. And when appropriate, respond offline. I think it's very, very common sense. And I don't think social media is, is going away. Um, it uh, might be a little confusing. It might be a little um, worrisome about what you should and shouldn't do, but it honestly boils down to common sense. Um, here is a page of resources for you that I drew some things from. I realized that instead of um, the CDC social media toolkit, I actually put the, repeated the Ohio State Medical Association there, and I apologize for that. Um, but um, you can find out just by going to the CDC, Googling CDC. And now I think it's time for some questions. Here's my email and my Twitter name and my practice site, and um, certainly I invite any of you to um, contact me. Uh, this way or through um, high tech answers, if there's anything I can answer for you after the uh, webinar. Carol? Well, no surprise, we've got a few questions. <laughs> before, before we begin, I, I do want to mention um, the Pew study that you talk about. I've actually read that study a couple of times and highly recommend um, that you go out and, and download the PDF. It's easy enough to get to. And uh, it will open your eyes, I think. Um, you know about who's doing what in the social media space. It, it really yeah, will. I yeah, agree. yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I'm going to start you with a great question <laughs> because this is a question I asked myself. Oh, I don't know, about a year and a half ago. Um, so, what is the difference between a Facebook account and a Facebook fan page? Well, they're actually making some changes to um, uh, what were previously called fan pages and and now they're call, let's see they're not calling them fan pages they're calling them something else they have made a great new change um that uh, i think just last week where um you can have a personal account and you can have a business account um and i'm probably not using it's probably not a business account but you can have a personal page and you can have a business page. And when you post comments, you can choose which pages those comments will go to. So from the standpoint of what is the, the difference between the two, there's really a, a very small difference, not in how they operate, but just in the ability for people to like your page so your posts show up you know, in their um, kind of news feed is how I think about it. Um, and there are opportunities um, for you to put ways for them to connect with you on Facebook by liking what you do, um, for instance, on my blog and on um, your entity's website. You can put the Facebook Like button. And so people can actually attach themselves 
to getting your posts in their kind of news feed on Facebook um, without ever being on Facebook direct. I mean, without coming to Facebook to find you. Yeah. So right. I consider it to be much easier to find a business. And I don't know, did that answer the question, Carol? Do you yeah, want to yeah, that? it did. And, you know, it, it, I think there's a lot of confusion out there, um, uh, you know, about you know, these changes that Facebook are making because they, they do come fast and furious. And, um, you know, this issue of the, the you know, the like, you know, um, that's sort of a recent development for them, too. It used to be that when you, when you liked a site, you ha- actually had to be logged into your Facebook account in order to like something, and that's, they've, you know, they've thrown that away. And that like, it, you know, as you say, it's that, it's, it's that vote of authority. You know, you said that in your PowerPoint. And so it, it's really critical. If you, if, you have a, if you have a Facebook fan page, um, you know, adding the like feature is, on your website is, is, is important for that reason um, because it does it, it weights it in Facebook's um, eyes basically yeah 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 um, yeah so um, next question a lot of actually several questions about Facebook um, mm-hmm. resources to helping setting up my, my Facebook page and I know you love Mashable I love Mashable <laughs> yes certainly Mashable um, there are a number of um, great um, authorities in setting up Facebook pages. There isn't anything that's healthcare specific, but I don't see anything about um, healthcare that's different from pretty much any other. Um, and I should have given you a couple examples of uh, Facebook pages that I um, that I think are really well done. There's a pediatric one um, that my friend Brandon uh, Bentoncourt runs. That I is think that Children's really Hospital well. of Boston? Pardon me? Is that Children's Hospital of Boston? No, this is um, his blog is Pediatric Inc. and I think his um, Facebook is S Pediatrics. Salute oh, okay. Pediatrics. Right. Um, you probably have some too. Maybe we can, uh, Carol, put our heads together and on VEC put something that um, is kind of like a good examples to look at. Yeah, that was the next question. And, I, I, oh, you know, I've actually had several people ask me that question. And, and um, you know, uh, Children's Hospital Boston is one I always, at least for a hospital, recommend, um, you know, because they actually sort of set the benchmark. You know, mm-hmm. they've got, like, really half million, half million likes, you know, and, and they just do a terrific job. And it's just one of those sites that people sort of point to. But that's a great idea. We should um we should put we'll 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 put our head Mary Pat and I will put our heads together and we will we will post something in the VEC on that because that actually several people ask that ask that question. Um, you know, just as you're getting started, I don't know about you, but you know, it was just so difficult to um you know where to start and even, you know, what to, how to go about this. And there are resources out there. And so, you know, maybe you and I can say this would be a great one for a hospital. It's a great one for a, a physician practice and, and, yeah, and some resources. In fact, somebody just um, chatted, are you saying Mashable? <laughs> 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 it is. It's, ma- it's Mashable. It's M-A-S-H-A-B-L-E.com, Mashable.com. Mashable. Mashable.com, and you you will become a fan <laughs> if you go there. <laughs> yeah. um, there's also a, um, and you know I could definitely do a um, you know um, Facebook and healthcare how to set up your Facebook page in healthcare webinar if that's something that you think would be of great interest. Um, I think I so. Yeah, yeah. Because once you once you know how to do it, you go, aha. You know what I mean. But again, if you go to Facebook, you know how it is. You're like, oh gosh. You know, just just grabbing your public URL. You know, it takes some explanation, and and again, it makes sense once you read it. But you're like, how do how how do you do that? You know. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um. Oh yeah. Okay. So so people are chatting me, going, yes, please set up a Facebook seminar. <laughs> I'd be glad to do that. I'd love to do that. <laughs> well, alrighty. The people are at, we're hearing from our audience. The people are saying, "Set it up, set it up." We will. We're listening. We, we're listening exactly. Okay, for the attendees and, and listening. Yes, we will definitely set up a, a, a Facebook uh, a Facebook webinar because it's it's really you know it's really needed. They're they're you know Facebook is committed to to, to I think putting Google um, you know spanking them a little bit and yep. uh, you know because you know putting email out of business. Um, 
So no surprise, a HIPAA, a HIPAA question. How can individual physicians use Twitter and avoid HIPAA violations? And you definitely covered that um, in Ed, you know the, the Ed Bennett slide, but I think it's worth 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 mentioning again. Well, if you're talking about, um, and I'm not sure if 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 this attendee is asking about a dialogue. Um, Twitter, the way I think it should be used, is uh, more of just um, not a dialogue between a patient and a physician, but just a dialogue about healthcare things on a very high level. So I'm not suggesting that um, physicians and their patients should dialogue about individual things on Twitter, but just that I think it's a really great place to um, get uh, important information about healthcare and point to news stories in healthcare and not so much um, build a community the way I'm suggesting on Facebook. Um, yeah. I think Twitter is really for um, a very different person or a very yeah. different purpose. Yeah, and there are lot there are lots of physicians who do a great, and maybe we can even build that out in the back to the list of list of physicians. We actually have um, our MD to MD page on our high tech answer site as a public page. There are lots of physicians out there that do an awesome job um, in 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 the world of Twitter, and of, and of course they're not it's not a dialogue with their patients, but you know it it really as you say builds their authority. There was also I actually read it today. Um, I can't remember which medical journal, but they did a study of physicians on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 it wasn't the American Medical. It wasn't the it wasn't the MA uh, AMA, but it was um, it was another leading uh, medical medical journal. They did a study on Twitter, and um, you know they looked at something like six thousand tweets, you know, from a variety of different physicians, and found that um, less than five. I mean, so the headline was very sort of provocative, you know, about Twitter and, and physicians using Twitter. But when you read the article, they found that less than five percent were what they deemed quote, you know, inappropriate, meaning the physician was talking about, you know, maybe their sex lives or something, you know, inappropriate from the sense of, you know, you, you know, if you're a business professional, you don't want to maybe be talking about that on Twitter. Um, but that, you know, there, 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 there might have been the rare um, HIPAA violation, but, 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 but incredibly rare, right? There is one uh, doc who tweets um, who I do happen to follow him. I'm not sure why I follow him because I find him some comments that he makes um, just um, sort of like he's venting. And I don't really consider that professional. And yeah. there are some blogging physicians that, you know, make some comments not about specific patients in a way that you could identify them, but just talking about, you know, this is what's happening in the hospital and this is what really makes me mad and this kind of thing. And, and um, I really don't, I mean, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not We're not talking about that. We're talking about doing things professionally and building your brand. I also, too, it's sort of interesting, you know, speaking of being professional and building your brand, and I, this, is, this is a true story. This actually happened this morning um, with me, and I, and I thought about this this morning. I thought, you know, I need to share this on this event tonight um, because this is, this is how monitoring your conversation um, really, really is key and important. So I took my cat to the vet this morning, and um, I was sitting. It was very early, and I was sitting in the office, and there were the, there were the, the two people in 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 the office, you know, at, at the front desk, you know, logging patients in and and administrative staff, and um, a vet called in for one of the other vets, and uh, and so this the the person at the desk said, you know, pass the call through, you know, this this other vet who was some not related to the practice, but but a different vet was calling from this vet. And these two people started talking about, well, isn't that like the blind leading the blind? And they actually started, you know, basically trashing these two vets. Now, you know, I'm not somebody that would take that conversation and put it out on Twitter, you know, because I because I thought in my head, well, are they talking about my vet? You know, who, you know, what vet are they talking about in this practice? You know, and I, but 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 that's what can happen. So sometimes these social media conversations happen in your own office and you don't know it, especially if you're not monitoring it, because I could have very easily 
have tweeted that, like, you know, oh gosh, you know, sitting in my vet's office with my cat and like they're talking about how dumb their 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 vet, you know, their vets are. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know, it it, it so it, it it becomes important. You know, you don't know if people are talking about you. You know, you you never know, and it's just the social media sphere sort of opens up that gate. And so I think that you know, for a lot of you know practices out there, you know, remind your your front staff as well that you know you may say something you might be venting at the front and you may you don't think people are listening and they are listening and maybe that they're sending it out in the social media space and you don't even know it. Yes. Yes, very good point. Yeah, yeah. So your 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 point about being professional I think is just you, like you know don't say something that you know as you said you wouldn't want on a, on the front page of a newspaper. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. We've had several more requests to do a, a Facebook uh, webinar, so I think that caps We're it for the evening. We're going to have to do it. That's all there is to do it. <laughs> it sounds like fun. It does sound like fun. <laughs> all right, so we'll put that together, and we'll, we'll pro we should probably target that for, uh, for, for the end of March, early April.